This is actually happening features real experiences that often include traumatic events. Please consult the show notes for specific content warnings on each episode and for more information about support services. A couple announcements before today's episode. First, this will be the last new episode of 2023, as next week we begin our annual three-week winter holiday rebroadcast series with some of our best stories from a few years ago. But this week, today's new episode features Amy Chesler, whose story has been shared in the true crime community on other platforms, but who hasn't spoken to many of the details that continue to haunt her today. So we invited Amy on the show to hear her full life story, including her continued paths through trauma and healing. In other show announcements, I want to give a shout out to one of our incredible team members, Maya Samuel-Smith. Maya has been creating amazing new designs and illustrations for the show, and you can see her work on the This Is Actually Happening store on posters, postcards, and t-shirts. So go check out her work on the store at thisisactuallyhappening.com. Your purchases there help support Maya's work and the show's ongoing costs. If you want to help out in other ways, you can also become an ongoing patron at patreon.com slash happening. Thank you all again for your deep listening and continued support. Wishing you all a wonderful holiday and New Year's. And we'll be back with fresh new stories on January 16th. But now we bring you our last new episode of 2023. What if your brother became a monster? I called Jesse back. And I'm like, hey, I'm on my way home. And he's like, just don't go home. And I was like, what? And he's like, don't go home. What? What? Why? He wouldn't answer my question. He said, just don't go home. And he hung up. From Wondery, I'm Whit Misseldine. You are listening to This Is Actually Happening. Episode 303. What if your brother became a monster? Today's episode is brought to you by Apple Pay. Fussing with plastic cards should be a thing of the past. Instead, pay the Apple way. Apple Pay is easy, secure, and built into iPhone. All you have to do is set it up. Just add a card in the wallet app and you're good to go. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is the home of storytelling. Audible offers an incredible selection of audio titles across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, and more. Currently, I'm revisiting a brilliant classic audiobook, Being Wrong, by Katherine Schultz. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash happening or text happening to 500 500 that's audible.com slash happening or text happening to 500 500 to try audible free for 30 days audible.com slash happening my mom was actually born in israel But they moved to the East Coast and slowly migrated their way to the San Fernando Valley. It was kind of a struggle for her. She didn't know English when she came here. She was about five years old. And my grandmother was a professor. They instilled in her education. My grandfather was also a little bit of a Lothario. Kind of a gambler, a businessman. So her parents had a little bit of a rocky, tumultuous relationship. My mom was a very strong, willed, kind of tomboyish kid. Her dad was really firm. As jovial and loving as he could be at times, he could be abusive. I think she had this toxic relationship with men that was born from her relationship with her father. And I think that that relationship with her father that was kind of laced with love but also pain told her that love wasn't peaceful and love wasn't stable. I believe that she just entered this sort of space of not loving herself, of not knowing her worth. In high school, my mom met my dad. He began drinking around the age of 16. 
to kind of deal with a hard relationship with my grandfather on that side, who is a war veteran who survived World War II, just a very hard man. My dad was a musician. He had aspirations of being a rock star. He won the Battle of the Bands at the Hollywood Bowl in 1970. And my mom just felt hard and fast for him. However, he was married at 18, and his dad forced him to get an annulment. His ex-wife actually died by the time he was like 18 and a half, and it really just changed him forever. My mom kind of stayed for years in hopes of like being with my dad and dealt with a lot. He created this really toxic relationship with my mom. He cheated on her many times with many women, and it actually did end up becoming abusive. And my mom hung in there for many years until he married her on her birthday, 1981. She would eventually tell me, if you ever get married, don't get married on your birthday, because if they forget one, they forget both. They had my brother about five days before her birthday in 1982, And it would eventually end with my father leaving her for another woman. And then they separated two weeks before they conceived me. I was kind of a last hurrah. At that point, she vowed to just pour all of herself into our family. She never dated again. And I don't think that was out of resentment because she was a flirt. I just think that she was equipped with a knowledge of herself at that point, that she knew her boundaries and she just knew her energies. And as a single mom, it wasn't a priority for her from then on. We became her priority. She was actually the mother to all of my friends who didn't have good relationships with their moms. She adopted everybody. Like if I had a play date, that kid who just came over to play when I was young would become her child. Like we wouldn't watch TV. We would never be stuck in front of something. She'd be teaching us a craft. She was just an exceptional person. Kind of went above and beyond for other people. I never lived with my father. He was never really a fixture. He was kind of in and out. His alcoholism really prevented him from being present. And that deeply affected my brother. At a young age, he was three when he left. I was just born. And I think his absence really didn't affect me as deeply as my brother because I had never known his presence, except very wishy-washy and unstable and drunk. School quickly became my haven in youth. There was, like, no weird adjustment period of going to school. I just, like, loved school instantly. First of all, my mom was my kindergarten teacher. I went to school for free at a really nice school. We lived in the home of the preschool owner. All the kids in the class started calling her mom because I called her mom. That fostered for me a love of education. Like, I kind of saw my mom as my hero. But my brother was older, and even starting in elementary school, there were differences pointed out. Like, I was a social butterfly, and as early as fourth grade, he was experiencing issues in the classroom. We grew up in Calabasas, a small town at that point, and reputations spread fast in those kind of communities. And as my brother's troubles grew, I poured myself more into school I put myself in the role of, like, being as good as possible. I always was really social. Teachers really validated me. I think as the years progressed, it became very clear that for every ounce of sociability I had or extrovertedness, my brother was virtually the opposite. He had a great deal of trouble connecting with other kids. He had a great deal of trouble eventually connecting with his teachers as well. He was extremely antisocial. And I don't mean in the sense that he was totally not social. Antisocial can mean in the sense that he can socialize, but he goes against the grain of social standards. He wasn't really super withdrawn, but he was volatile at a very young age. He would argue back. 
He would question authority. He started doing that at home. He started fighting against homework. Now, these are all very innocuous things, but it's the beginning. His antisocial tendencies also began to encompass at a very young age the thought of, people are tools to me. He's not there to build a community. He's there to see what he can gain from other humans. There's like a level of manipulation he began to hone at a very young age. So that continued to undo the seams of his connectivity to his peers, to his classmates. And he then kind of just evolved. And in, at the age of 16, he had gotten into so many fights with peers. He was very volatile at home and started an infinite amount of unnecessary arguments, whether they were outrightly physically abusive or, you know, verbally. A lot of it started with him. At school, they said, you know, why don't you just take your GED and get out? And he did. My mom was furious that the school system gave up on him, but he just wasn't, I suppose, fit for it. And he tested out. And then that was like a very pivotal point. I was in middle school at that time. By that point, a lot of abuse had happened. The physical abuse began to our environment more than anything. He would scream, he would yell, he would punch holes in the wall, or he lit a fire in a bathtub and blamed it on me because the fire department came. And there was sexual abuse. He blackmailed me to sexually assault myself with objects in front of him. It just evolved as abuse does. At that point, the abuse became very severe physically. I think that he was going through something deeply emotional and he tried to inflict that on us. 1999 would have been his graduation year. That is the year that the shooting at Columbine High School happened. And my brother, I think if he had stayed in school, would have executed something like that. My mom ended up having a major accident. She was wheelchair bound, sometimes stuck in her bed for weeks. And so he was kind of forced into caretaker, but like a nurse ratchet type of caretaker. My mom was virtually handicapped, very, very limited driving because her pain ebbed and flowed at times. I eventually became the driver in the family as soon as I got my permit. I started taking care of myself really young. I don't think I was parentified, but I did have the weight that I gave myself personally to give my mom a saving grace in parenting. I took that as an impetus to excel at all things. I had a really nerdy reputation at school for being like the teacher's pet. And I got picked on a lot for that. But people didn't understand that was literally my haven. I don't know if I dealt with a lot emotionally then. During those years, I threw myself into building a resume, volunteering for the sheriff's department, and candy striping at the motion picture hospital. And at 17, I got my first two jobs, I found efficacy in that. And I think that I also found disassociation <laughs> to a certain degree emotionally. I had seen my mom do that. She never really had time to process emotions. And I think I just didn't process anything. I was in survival mode because I had to be. So I was out of the house a lot. And the abuse between my mom and my brother was getting very severe. I had a pager, and I would get pages from my mom, you know, if she needed me. And there'd be incidents where my brother would have pushed her, and she couldn't get up. He would hit her. He would punch her. He would berate her. As the physical and mental abuse spiked when I'm about 16 or 17, it is extremely hard to be in that home. It was not a safe space. You think of your home as like a nesting area, somewhere you make yourself comfortable. I never had that ability. It was constant warfare because he would constantly pick fights about everything. There was just a fear I think he wanted to instill in both of us because he never felt comfortable outside of the home. At this point, he had been turned away by school and he was being cared for by like mental health professionals, but they were quitting on him because he would unleash rage on them and they would be afraid. The mental health industry didn't have any way to care for him, didn't offer us solutions. 
Technically, his diagnoses are bipolar disorder, OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, ADD, and Tourette's syndrome. I think at that time, he felt isolated and angry, and that's what he was trying to elicit on us. The thing is, is that my mom allowed me to be out of the house as much as I could because I was doing proactive, healthy things. The freedom that my mom gave me to go find that peace, I think that was a saving grace. With enough surgeries and enough proper care, my mom eventually overcame these disabilities. So when mom finally returns to work, I'm 17, I'm just graduating high school. Jesse is about 21. We finally move into her dream home. She buys her first home, but she could never have people over. She couldn't have holiday dinners because my brother's explosive fits of rage could end things like that. You know, family didn't want to be around that. My mom didn't want to have that instability or that question. We called the cops many times in all of this. And in Calabasas, they really didn't know what to do. There was one sheriff's department. It was right behind our house, actually. So it would take a minute or two for people to come. And they came. And they would throw him in a drunk tank for a little while. And we'd get a little reprieve. And at that time, when I knew he was away, when it was just my mom and I, there was like ultimate peace and love. And that became a point of contention for Jesse, too. Towards the end of high school, I was starting to build a healthier inner voice. My mom instilled so much self-value in me, but my brother's narrative and voice that he applied to me did the opposite. I stopped allowing all of his damaging words in probably around the time I was 17. I was developing a sense of self outside of the way other people were defining me. He would bag on my looks, and at that time I felt very ugly. I was picked on for my looks as a child. He would constantly talk about my appearance. But, like, if he called me dumb, that's when I think the holes started to appear for me. As I found success, I felt better, and I felt like I was shedding some of that. But I also felt bad for him, because I think it made me think, oh, he's doing this because he's jealous. I think also he weaponized his mental illness. And I think that I gave him the benefits of the doubt and many benefits of that diagnosis in giving him rebounds in our relationship. Another thing is that my mom never gave up on him. She's calling the cops. She's trying to get him therapists that will stick with him. But underneath it all, she's never going to give up on him. And I think that is where a lot of his resentment built towards my mother, especially asking for him to take accountability. And then also in that abusive relationship, she kept letting him back in. He hated my mom for loving him so hard because I think he felt so unlovable. Today's episode is brought to you by Aura Frames. Here's a simple but meaningful gift idea for that parent or grandparent who lives across the country. A digital picture frame from Aura. I was recently at home for Thanksgiving, and we ended up sorting through hundreds of old family photos. From our ancestors, through terrible hair portraits from the 80s, through recent family trips. I can't wait to get all these digitized and uploaded to Aura to gift my parents for the holidays this year. It's super simple to set up. It took just a couple minutes to download the app, connect the frame, and then you're ready to pick photos and videos right from your phone from anywhere in the world. Aura Frames was just named the best digital photo frame by Wirecutter, and it's easy to see why. Give the best gift ever this holiday season. Right now, listeners can save by visiting auraframes.com slash happening. That's A-U-R-A frames.com slash happening. Use promo code happening to get $30 off Aura's best-selling frames. Get yours now before they sell out. Terms and conditions apply. Today's episode is brought to you by Hero Bread. What is a bready go-to or guilty pleasure over the holidays that you don't eat as often as you want in an attempt to consume fewer carbs? Mine is definitely the stuffing, my favorite part of any holiday meal. Well, now you can have that guilty pleasure without the guilt. Hero Bread has 0 to 1 grams of net carbs. 0 grams of sugar is high in fiber and contains fewer calories and more protein per serving than the conventional version of the same baked goods. 
Many of my favorite foods involve bread, grilled cheese, French toast, and even peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But I also maintain a strict diet and workout routine. Now, with Hero Bread, I've been enjoying more of these options again, without distracting from my healthy regimen. Hero Bread is offering 10% off your first order to our listeners. Go to hero.co and use code HAPPENING at checkout. That's H-A-P-P-E-N-I-N-G at H-E-R-O dot C-O. When I was, I think, 18 years old and he was 21, he joined the army. He entered and he didn't fit in. He supposedly got pneumonia and he came home. And that was another disconnect from society. And that was another thing my mom had believed in him that he could do. And he failed again in his eyes, I believe. That's what he's thinking. And he became even more volatile. At one point, he did go back to the military again. This time, supposedly, he had been abused by somebody in the military, like in his boot camp experience, and he dropped out. He fled in the middle of the night and ended up supposedly getting a bench warrant for being AWOL. He had been honorably discharged the first time. This time he went back, couldn't complete boot camp again. My mom knew all this and was like just wanting to protect him because, oh, she felt so bad. He had been victimized. And, you know, my mom, again, just wanted to give him that soft space, wanted to be that maternal figure for her own son. But at that time, my mom's abuse at Jesse's hands heightened even more. So you're now, what, 24, 25. He had many girlfriends at this time that he would abuse for either an apartment or a place to live when he was fighting with mom and mom kicked him out. He racked up credit debt on many girlfriends' credit. He really leveraged any one he could in any situation he could. He kind of was grasping at straws at this point in our lives. I was in the deep throes of college. I was going to school full-time, and then I was working part-time jobs. So I was out of the house a lot. I was living at home. My campus, CSUN, was 30 minutes from where I lived, so I was traveling to school and staying there virtually all day. I couldn't afford to move out, so I was staying out as much as I could. But in college, that was when Mom and I got really close because we had many more moments without Jesse at home. It was a really great time for both of us. She went back to work finally. Her career was mostly in teaching middle school. We worked on the same campus for about four years. She was like forever my cheerleader. And she started finding her rhythm. She found a campus she really loved. She dabbled with the idea of going back to dating. But Jesse hacked her dating profile and said some terrible things for people to stop talking to her. And she just, you know, gave up on that idea. But she went back to full force. She found her voice and she got to eventually teach high school, which was her dream. As much as she didn't date, she tried to empower me, like, go out and date. Go find out what you don't want. Find out what you do want. Be safe, but go have fun. And she always made it clear that as much as she supported me in dating and going out and doing my thing, my value was not out there. My value was internal. We both found our groove while Jesse, his future disintegrated. I think he saw in himself that in that antisocial behavior, by making people tools, you kind of make your life dependent on other people. So I think he saw that he had no efficacy as a human by himself. And my mom, again, represented all of that eternal value that he didn't have, and it became a turning point in our family. At that time, I'm 22, gearing up for graduation from college. My degree is in psychology. I've got some more understanding that I had before of my brother's diagnoses, of the world, of family systems, of the effect of siblings. I remember I stumbled on an article in college that said, The relationship with your sibling has the same impact on you as the parents that you're raised with. And I think that hit home. 
in stepping into this education and in stepping into this kind of new adult-ish role in becoming a woman and actually getting my first full-time job, I think I had been given more perspective of my brother. I did understand I didn't have to put up with his behavior as much. Boundaries were easier for me to place. Cognitive behavioral therapy, something I would learn throughout college, is the idea that small steps make big change. All those little baby steps of setting boundaries and not being able to be home and not be able to be the fulcrum between my mom and my brother allowed me to see my brother for more of what he was or how he treated me and that I didn't have to stand for it. In April of 2007, as things are kind of reaching their tipping point, he pulled a knife on my mom and threatened her life. He jumped off our second story balcony onto our cars like the hoods were all dented and then ran off. My mom called the cops. He was arrested and he was detained. As these incidents progressed and got more physically violent, the months he stayed in jail would become longer. And my mom would eventually drop charges each time. While he was in jail, she was visiting him every weekend. She never gave up that love. She never gave up on that support, even if he was hurting her. Most of that abuse happened when I wasn't home. I didn't have an immediate view of it. So I was just getting these calls like, Jesse just did this thing. I called the cops. He's going to jail again. And so when she would say, I think he's going to hurt me, I hope I don't die, I'm saying no, 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 because I also haven't quite seen it get that bad in front of my eyes. Even those of us who watch a bunch of true crime and watch documentaries all the time, we're still thinking in our own home, most of us can count on that safety. September 25th, 2007 was much like many other days for me. It was a long day at work. The school that I was working at, it was in Porter Ranch, which is about 30 minutes from where my house was. So it was like a 12-hour day. I start getting phone calls from my brother and my mom. They started between like 2 and 4 in the afternoon. It was very common for me to talk to my mom a lot throughout the day. At that point, we were no longer working on the same campus. She called me and she kind of sounds like a little stressed. I don't know what it was about, but she asks me when I'm going to be home. I explain I'm not going to be home for a while. And not long after my mom's phone call, I got a call from Jesse. And it was a similarly frictional phone call. I didn't really know what was happening, but the fact that they both called me back to back, I was like, something's probably happening. They're probably fighting. And he asked me, he's like, hey, do you want to watch Quantum Leap when you get home? I was like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, 10, 1030 at night. That's pretty late. But... I'll keep in touch, and then we end our phone call. And my mom calls. And my mom says again, hey, what time are you going to be home? I was like, look, I already told you, going to be home pretty late. You know, this is maybe the fourth call I've had with my mom today. So I'm like, it'll be a while. And then I was like, why? Is everything okay? And she said, fine. And I said, okay. And she said, fine, bye. And I said, bye. About 10 minutes later, Jesse called me again another back-to-back phone call. And I was like, okay, this is weird. But I do pick up. And he's like, when are you coming home? Same thing my mom said virtually. And I was like, not until 10, 10 10.30. And he's like, fine, bye. I go back to work. I make sure all the kids get picked up so my staff can get off. And then I start heading home. And this is around 10, 10 10.15 at night. I have about a 30-minute drive. But I'm driving and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to call him back. I call Jesse back. And I'm like, hey, I'm on my way home. You still want to watch Quantum Leap? And he's like, no. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, just don't go home. And I was like, what? And he's like, don't go home. What? What? Why? He wouldn't answer my question. He said, just don't go home. And he hung up. So I call my mom, and of course my heart is beating faster at this point, because I'm like, that's a really weird thing to say. Like, I I obviously don't know what's in store for me, but I know something is weird. So my heart is racing, and I call home. She doesn't pick up, and I'm like, that's weird. She always picks up, especially if I'm dialing as I come home from work or it's late at night. In case something happened, she'd want to pick up to be there for me. I think I called twice, still didn't pick up. 
So I called Jesse. And at this point, I'm probably like halfway home. And I say, hey, what's up? Mom's not picking up. What's up? Why wouldn't I go home? And he was like, just don't go home. And I was like, look, you have to tell me what you're talking about. What is going on? And he said, I killed mom. I said, no, you didn't, you fucking liar. And then he hung up. I called home again because I was like, there's just no way. This is a sick joke. So I call home again, expecting my mom to pick up, and she doesn't. And I'm like, what do I do? So I call my brother back. And at this time, his phone had been shut off. I had this moment of reconciling with myself, thinking, what if this is true? And she's dying without me? What if this is not true? And I get, like, the police coming after me for making a false 911 call? There were so many thoughts that ran through my head. Within the 30 seconds that I ran through all those possibilities, at the end of that 30 seconds, I thought, no matter what the situation is, any, like, ramification I would face in making a false call would pale in comparison to what potentially could be going on. So I started dialing 911. I think I took like a couple calls for me to connect to the service and then I'm waiting and someone picks up and I explain that I'm driving home. I don't know if it's true. I explain I think my mom might have been murdered. I don't know. And the woman is on the phone with me when I arrive at home. I pull up in our driveway and I'm on the phone with 911 as I rush into the house. I walk in and to the left is a powder room. I look in the powder room. Nothing is wrong. I look to the right and is like a formal dining area over like a little ledge. Everything is fine there. I progress one more room and I look into the kitchen, which is her favorite room in the house. And I found her on the floor in the kitchen. A knife was sticking out of her neck and she was lying in a large pool of blood. And I was screaming. I don't even remember that, but I have since heard the 911 call. And I was just screaming. And then through the scream, I hear, ma'am, the woman is on the phone with me. Ma'am, the killer might still be inside. And in that moment, it registered that my brother is a killer. So I knew I had to get out. I looked at her body one more time. Like, I didn't know if she was still dying. I don't know. I, I assumed she was dead. I didn't really see her face because she was looking away, but right outside of her hand was the phone. It was on the ground. I guess she maybe had been trying to call 911 or me or I don't know. I saw that the only kind of like untainted portion of her body was her leg. And I hugged her leg. And then I ran out of the house. Just about the moment I stepped out, the police cars showed up. They park, they start questioning me immediately, trying to get information, especially considering I had reported on the 911 call that, you know, my brother was at large. So I just remember standing outside and answering occasional questions and waiting. And I remember just like staring at the mountains and the police lights, red and blue, just kind of flashing against the green mountains. And I remember looking up at the sky and seeing like helicopters and hearing helicopters, which are still really triggering for me. And I thought they were the police looking for my brother, but it turned out they were the news choppers, like, covering the story as it unfolded. As I stood out there and answered questions, and we were waiting for Jesse to be captured, just neighbors started coming out of their homes, trying to figure out what was going on. My mom's best friend from middle school lived two houses down, and he came out, and he felt awful. I think they felt a lot of guilt that it happened while they were home. That man and his wife, they invited us all into their home a few houses down as the hours progress and we still wait for Jesse. More and more people have shown up. My boss shows up, my ex-boyfriend who lived up the street, who had a better relationship with my mom than me. Like, he remained a friend. And we just sat there and waited for Jesse to be captured. When the reality hit me and I was sitting there with that community and I'm thinking, I can't go back to that house. I don't have a home. I don't have a family. In that moment, I just realized I had lost a lot of things I defined myself by or people I defined myself by. And 
ties that I bound myself to. I think sometimes my mom gave up her life for me to be free of my brother. Not that this was like an intentional act and she allowed this to happen, but in that moment, as I was surrounded by my mom's best friend from second grade, by her best friend from middle school, by my aunt, by my uncle, by my ex-boyfriend who loved her, I think I was just sitting there in immense gratitude for her and intense depression for the loss of her. We kind of congregated in this friend's house, two houses down, until finally, I think about one or two o'clock in the morning, the police called and said they found Jesse hunkered down in the back of a vehicle. Jesse had called some friends. He actually sent pictures of my mom's dead bodies to them. And he said, I just need help. Get me a ride. So he got a ride from a friend of a friend. As he's driving Jesse to I don't know where. The guy called the cops because he obviously suspected Jesse had done something bad. He was acting erratically. He eventually would hunker down in the car and take a bunch of drugs so he would test positive for drugs that evening. There was an unarmed standoff until they captured him. We got the news as we waited. I think we assumed like, okay, he's caught. He's going to prison. Bye. (laughs) Forever. And that is absolutely not how it unfolded. The years following my brother's capture were filled with emotional abuse, litigative abuse. He used the system as a tool against me. For a while, it was even hard to call him my brother. Over a four and a half year period, he would use different mechanisms in the system to change his status as a perpetrator, meaning he would get on medications for like bipolar disorder and OCD or whatever, and then get off of it, which would mean he would be unfit to stand trial if he was off of his meds. And then he would just get back on them and then he would get off of them. So there was this two year period where he was using his medication and his diagnoses as a tool to evade any sort of sentencing or trial or plea deal or anything. He tried to plead that he killed her by reason of diminished capacity, meaning at the time of her murder, he did not know the ramifications of what he was doing. And what ended up being the thorn in his side with that is that statement in my recounting of that evening, he had clearly told me, at least twice, don't go home, as if he had something to protect me from, as if something had been done wrong. So that kind of kiboshed that argument. He's like at his wits ends. He's tried everything. I mean, he's tried representing himself. He's fired lawyers, hired lawyers. There's so many things he did. And then the last thing he tried was he tried to hire a hitman from jail because apparently one of the men he had befriended was getting out. He wrote him a letter. He said, look, my sister planned my mom's murder. She promised me X, Y, and Z money. It basically gave this inmate a stalking plan. He said, like, show up at my sister's house, cover her car in post-it notes, do whatever you got to do to scare her into saying she had a part in this. I promise I'll share with you. The inmate who received the letter, who would eventually give it to the police, the police called me out of nowhere They didn't tell me on the phone what had happened or what had been received, but they did say, look, Amy, we got to talk to you immediately. I don't know what they want to tell me. I'm thinking, oh my God, my brother's been murdered. Oh my God, my brother's dead. It's a mix of emotions at that point. Like, what has happened? So many feelings. And when they sit down in my home, the detective says, is this your brother's writing? They flash this letter to me and I say, yep, why? My stomach is a pit. The detective says to me, Jesse says, You had something to do with the murder. Did you plan your mom's murder? It was a very gut-wrenching thing to receive, this accusation. The fact that they were questioning me so many years in, it was just a gut punch. And I said, of course, I had nothing to do with it. And he said, Jesse basically tried to convince an inmate that you planned it. He wanted him to get you to admit it or kill you. Like, that's where we're at. That was the end. It put me where he wanted to put me, to exhaust me. So when the DA said to me, do you want him to take a plea deal, second degree murder, 
He's like, look, second degree is not what we want. We want to prove forethought. And that's first degree murder. And second degree murder is like for a more reactive murder, like in the heat of the moment, passion murder. That wasn't ideal. It was a lesser sentence. In California, it was 15 to life instead of 25 to life. But at that point, the DA said to me, look, basically life is life. Once you get a life sentence in California, that's it. And so I was like naively, yeah, okay. End this shit. I need a break. This was my mom's murder four years before and then torment and no time to grieve. It keeps us from even healing, like the amount of hearings you have to sit through or be postponed through or take time off for. It's gutting. On top of the grief that we're almost not even allowed to tap into because of how the systems re-traumatize us. So he got his sentence in 2011. Around that time, I had just gotten married. I also got pregnant. Had a lot of big changes that distracted me from some serious emotions. And I don't think I grieved. That is the point in my life where I really went, oh shit, I can't just work my way through this stuff. If I wasn't going to do it for myself and get it out, I was going to do it for my kids. It's just a really interesting space to be in when you know the work you have to do, but you just don't know how to do it. I think it took the Me Too movement. I think it took social change. All those things gave me tools. I am stepping into this space of digging into what I went through and sharing it. And that has changed my progression and grief. I was like, I have the chance to heal so much in this, but if I'm going to do that, there's some heavy shit I need to get through. And that's triggering for me at times, but it also can kind of force you to face some of those realities and then work through them. And I realized I need to advocate for my children, but also I need to advocate for myself to be the best parent for my children. I became a grief writer. I didn't really dive into the true crime side of what I had gone through because there was just so much grief in losing my mother in losing my best friend and losing my anchor that I had to go through the grief first. Then I could get th to the realities and the harshness of things. I lend a voice to my mom because I knew her intimately. I lend a voice to myself, but I also teach people how to employ boundaries by seeing warning signs, by facing harsh realities. As I was researching statistics while I was writing my memoir, 50% of American children face sibling abuse in some facet during their life. Emotional, physical, mental, sexual. That was mind-blowing. My divorce was legally finalized March of 2020. And then the next week, COVID hit. And then the following week, I sold my book. Life was like delivering me validation. Like, look, your inclination to share this, your inclination to dig this up is of service. I didn't know how it would be of service yet, but it helped me honor my mom. That was my first mission, like honoring her, making sure her death was not in vain, and also just healing my shit in the process and letting all of it go. February of 2021, a couple months before my book is slated, I had a conversation with my friend, Tiffany Reese, and she has an incredible podcast called Something Was Wrong. And she asked me if I would share my story on her show. And so that actually came out right before my book did, which was immensely healing. And I got such immediate feedback from people saying, me too. It was really validating to hear from a lot of people. I feel less alone Today's episode is brought to you by ButcherBox. Sometimes the best gifts are the ones you give yourself. And ButcherBox is here to help you treat yourself to more delicious, wholesome meals. They take the guesswork out of finding high-quality meat with humanely raised beef, pork, chicken, seafood, and more, delivered to your doorstep. ButcherBox partners with folks who share their high-quality standards and truly care about how animals are raised. Plus, they're B Corp certified. After a long and busy day, there's no better feeling than knowing I can skip the grocery store because I have food I can trust already waiting for me in my freezer. All this at an incredible value. I've really loved all the meals I've made from ButcherBox. You can truly taste the difference in quality. Sign up today at ButcherBox.com happening. 
and use code HAPPENING to get free chicken wings for a year. That's three pounds of free-range organic chicken wings, free in every order, for a year, when you sign up at butcherbox.com slash happening, and use code HAPPENING. This is Actually Happening is sponsored by BetterHelp. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or anxiety about it. I know for me, ramping up the new season is always fresh and exciting. But as I get deeper into the fall, the pace of content creation with the coming holidays and outside pressures can become overwhelming. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change. Something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. Therapy for me has always been the perfect container to give me spaciousness when my schedule is feeling packed and constrained, and to create that bright spot in my day. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash happening today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash happening. April 2022, I found out my brother was up for parole for the first time. The wind was knocked out of my sails. I was shocked. I was livid. I had this huge impetus to get my book out. I wanted as many people to hear what had happened. I did a lot of book club meetings. I was like fired up. I did a New York Post article. I wanted to bring as much attention as possible. What happened at this parole hearing, I got cleared to speak at it and give a victim impact statement. And it's Zoom, and he's pulling down his mask and sneering, and a couple times he, like, sliced his thumb across his throat at me. And, like, right off the bat, the parole board says, look, sir, you committed this murder at 25 years old, nine months. That technically is a youth offender, which I didn't realize until that moment. I was like, excuse me, what? Then Jesse dives in. He's like, look, I came here a bad guy. I only got worse. I've stabbed over 90 people since getting here. I'm not rehabilitating. And I, at that moment, am shocked and frozen. I'm like, how is he getting this space to speak? How has he stabbed 90 people and there's no ramifications and we're at a parole board hearing? Like, I lost my shit. So I said, you've already done the worst thing possible. You killed our mom. And I'm bawling. And they asked me to mute myself. And at that point, Jesse says, oh, I could do a lot worse. And then he recites a recent address of mine and says, I could have friends come visit you, you and your children. I'm like quivering and shaking and crying and shocked. And after they discuss a couple other things and he's like, oh, I want to postpone my hearing till 2023. And they're like, "Okay." And then he says, I want to actually also request a move up north to be near family because I have family that supports me. Then they let me make my statement, but Jesse said, I don't have to legally listen to this, right? They said basically, no, because you're postponing. So he walked out. So I didn't want to make a statement. At that point, I was just sobbing. And I said, why would I? And they said, well, we'll keep it in the file for next time. And so I made a statement, and that was that. And then I sat with that for a little bit. And I was like, what in the actual fuck just happened? I created a petition, thousands of signatures signed, letting these people know they better not let my brother out of prison. I'm mentally equipping myself, and this is that same litigative abuse that I had faced before. Very triggering, like, hearings. Up, it's coming. Up, it's not. Mental preparation, emotional preparation. Is he going to get out? It was just very life-altering to be thrown back into the system like that, that quickly. And then... 2023 came. I kept promoting my book. I kept letting everyone know this happens because the people like me that are navigating this system are shocked every day that we have to live this. It feels like a movie to a lot of us and it sounds like a movie to a lot of you, but it's reality. When I say like, oh, he threatened my life from a Zoom recorded parole hearing and he's still up for parole in a year or two, people don't believe me. So I like to share this for all of us to learn and grow and the systems to grow too, because this is clearly a failure in the system. 
because of my experiences in the legal system and in the media, I realized there was a lot of facets of true crime stories that were missing. I wanted to create a space for victims that could tell a more full-fledged story like what came next in their journey, not just what happened with the trauma, but how did they survive it? What was that like sharing for other people's healing? What portions of the legal system didn't get touched on? What came next? I eventually was given a date for that extended parole hearing. I got a phone call and they said, hey, we're victim services. We just want to let you know your brother has postponed his hearing again. He postponed it to 2025 because he's up for additional charges. I found his pending charges and it said attempted murder. So I called the DA. Hi, I need information about Jesse Winnick's case. That motherfucker is my brother, and I want to know what's going on right now. I told him about the death threat that I had faced at the parole hearing, everything that I had been experiencing, and all of the re-traumatization, and I wanted to know what he was doing. When I did give him the transcript of the parole hearing, I was like, look, page blah blah blah, he recited this address, like, this is insane. He looked at the paperwork, he's like, oh yeah, that is absolutely a valid death threat. He actually said he would add charges to what he was cultivating against my brother. Eventually, I found out from the DA that what my brother was up for was attempted murder against a public official, the correctional officer he attacked. He built a homemade mace. He attacked the correction officer. It was caught on camera. The officer, thankfully, is fine. So he was getting charged with that, a couple weapons charges, but he was getting a total of five new charges. Another thing people have questioned me about was like, oh, if he stabbed over 90 people since he's been in prison, how is he actually up for parole? Well, he stabbed other inmates. The DA showed me a stack. We couldn't even begin to count how many events he's been involved in. And he said, what is shocking and people most don't realize is that like, you're not going to get like a whole other murder charges for attacking a, an inmate. So it took him attacking a correctional officer. Here comes this day. And we get in the room, and there were many cases heard within the one room. And the judge that saw us that day is used to prison crimes unit cases. And the DAs that day were from prison crimes unit. I don't think they're used to seeing victims. I don't think they're used to having to navigate careful conversations. When it was finally our turn to be heard, he again gets to speak first. And he's like, I know my sister's here, but she's a bitch, cunt, liar. Whatever she says is full of shit. They... Let him kind of get through his tirade. They read off the charges. They said, do you understand these charges? And they said, do you accept the charges? Meanwhile, in all of that, I'm like sobbing. And the judge has told me to be quiet. They're shushing me because I'm emoting. This is something I hear from other victims that like sometimes their emotionality gets them removed from rooms or gets them invalidated as witnesses. And that's just insane to me because emotions are inherent in digging this up. But, you know, I'm sobbing, I'm getting quieted, I'm getting threatened to be thrown out of the room. And then my brother says, yes, I admit to trying to attack this correctional officer. I admit to threatening my sister's life and her kids' lives. And then he says, but if she makes a statement, I'm going to take my plea back. And I say to the DA, I'm like, excuse me, did he just say he wouldn't plead guilty if I make a statement? And he was like, yeah. And he's like, what do you want to do? And so I'm left in this moment, like, do I invalidate all of my experiences? Do I share with the world everywhere I can, but not with my brother? I don't ever get to make a statement because I hadn't up until now. So in that pivotal moment, I was like, you know what? I have learned to be an adult. I might be a sobbing mess at this point, but I have boundaries nonetheless. He does not have this control over me anymore. And I said, you know what? Tell the judge what he's doing. And so my lawyer did. And the judge just turned to him and said, she has the legal right to make a statement. If you're accepting charges, that means she's a victim. You have to hear her at that point. Another thing the judge did was at the beginning of my statement, she was like, uh, ma'am, I'm going to suggest that you allow me to give you a 30-day restraining order for your brother. And she explained, you know, a restraining order actually criminalizes any of his reaching out to you. If he has anyone reach out on his behalf, that it immediately becomes a crime. So in the end, I did make a statement. He talked the whole way through. The judge did not quiet him, even though I was quieted with my sobs. 
And I made my statement. And then she said, you know what? Actually, we're going to give you a 10-year restraining order. I think that my victim impact statement, the DA said it, it kind of changed everyone in that room. In the end, they went backwards and gave my mom retroactive justice. Because he has been given these new charges, he's no longer a youth offender. That status has been revoked. He also got six years for the death threat against me. They gave him 30 years to life for the attempted murder of the correctional officer and those related charges, which is shocking because, yes, he got 15 to life for his mom's actual murder, but got 30 years to life for an attempted murder of an officer. What that means is, in essence, he got a second life sentence. So at this point, it's almost impossible for him to get out. However, another thing that gives me comfort, he got a third strike. He had killed my mother. That was one strike. The attempted murder of the officer was a second strike. The fact that the DA allowed my death threat report and to see it as valid, he got a third strike for that death threat. And in California, if you get three strikes, you're out. That final piece of our story, as gutting as this process has been, justice can prevail if we're diligent enough, if we call for accountability from the system enough, if we have an advocate who believes and is on our side. But in our journeys, you know, the media really paints it out like true crime victims, things get wrapped up, we move on, and that's not the way it goes. There's always something next. And the most challenging piece in relation to my brother is just worrying he will one day find someone that believes that I had something to do with her murder and I have a lot of money to be gained and that he could get his hands on it if they kill me. That's my biggest fear is that one day he'll be effective in what he's tried. I've never felt like I was his target until he killed my mom. And then he didn't have her as a target left. And I became the obvious replacement. At that parole hearing, the original one in 2021, he said, I just showed up in essence to see what she was going to say. And once he found out that I was not speaking in favor of him, but against him, she's not in favor of me, goodbye. And as soon as that happened, and as soon as he delivered that death threat, I was like, oh, I am now the object of his resentment, if you will. And I never really think I thought I felt that way. I always felt like he resented mom. He kind of revered me. He abused me. But I eventually, I think what I saw his abuse was he was trying to knock me down from the pedestal he had almost put me on to a certain degree or society had put me on, but he recognized that I was on. When I look back at my relationship with my brother, it's very tainted from the get-go. I mean, he sexually abused me as early as my being 11, and there was abuse and manipulation and coercion before. So I don't even think I allow him in, in a, an emotional way and like, oh, I grieve this relationship with my brother. I don't look back fondly at all. I don't even look back, to be honest. I look forward and feel fear. I think the hardest thing for me was to step into adulthood and be thrown into planning a funeral. Paying for a funeral, paying for a mortgage, being an adult without my mom, without my guide. And it was really hard and it continues to be really hard. The hardest is her absence. I said like, oh, she gave her life for my freedom. That doesn't mean it makes it easy. Doesn't mean it makes it worth it. Doesn't mean it, I wouldn't trade everything for her back. I actually haven't heard her voice for 16 years. I haven't seen her on video for that long either. Like my mom, she did not like video. The hardest thing is that there is that absence, you know? There are ways I bring myself closer to her, but that's not the same thing. It, it never will be. You know, we all need our parents sometimes. And if we don't get to rely on them, that has a huge effect, whether it's because they're emotionally distant or emotionally unavailable, or they're addicts, or they're dead. There is a massive grief that interlaces almost everything. You know, I lost my dad, too, in this process. I lost my mom when I was 22, and she was 55. When I was 33, I lost my dad, and he was 66. My dad and I got a little closer after her murder. That ebbed and flowed, too, as it does when someone has an addiction. It's hard to remain as close as, you know, at times. But when I lost my dad, 
It was almost like a sense of relief because I had known he was so depressed and so wanting that for a long time, I think. Like yearned for that release. But I feel like I do sometimes carry that burden of I'm the sole survivor of our family, if you will. Like my brother's future has been determined now as of April 2023. And that gives me both solace and further heartache. It's not a survivor's guilt. It's more of like a survivor's weight. You know, a survivor's responsibility that I feel. Just because she's gone, the impact of all she did and said and cultivated is not gone. That's evident in my children. It's evident in my parenting. It's evident in me. One lesson my mom always left me with was the only way to truly fail is to stop trying. That's been driven home to me in every facet of my journey, especially since I started seeking more justice. As soon as I started working for it rather than waiting for it, that's when like everything shifted. I am infused with hope otherwise by knowing I'm doing the right thing by sharing. That's just who my mom and I are. So there is like a solace in continuing. We have to, as victims, not give up. I didn't know how this grief journey would be. I still don't know. Like the next interview I do might be entirely different than this one. And this one has brought up things that no other interview in 16 years has ever done. We talk about grief is not linear, but that's because life is not linear and we go up and down and our experiences are heavy and light. I have a daughter and a son, which is obviously the situation that I was born into. That's triggering for me at times. You know, I had kids who hit each other when they're baby. Like when a baby wants something, they don't have the words, they smack for it, right? And so that instantly, like, unfortunately, when you're triggered enough can take you to a place where you are hit. So parenting can be very, very triggering, but it also can, can kind of force you to face some of those realities and then work through them. I had a guest <laughs> that I interviewed yesterday and she said something brilliant to me. She said, what's not fixed is forwarded. Meaning what trauma is not fixed or worked through is forwarded through generations. So that's what hit me in the moment. When I saw my son and daughter kind of like begin their lives together, I was like, oh shit, I have the chance to heal so much in this. But if I'm going to do that, uh, there's some, some, some heavy shit I need to get through. One thing I learned from my journey is the only way out is through. The only way out of being mired in the muck or that immense weight of the responsibility of surviving is just like letting us feel those feelings, all the feelings from one end of the spectrum to the other, getting it out and moving through it. When we look back at history, there was like the industrial revolution. There are different revolutions that happened. I think we're in an emotional revolution right now. And there's so much that comes from like just listening to other people and hearing what actually is happening around the world and the duality of things and allowing it all in. It's very healing. Today's episode featured Amy Chesler. To find out more about her and her story, you can find her book, Working for Justice, on Amazon. Amy also has her own podcast, What Came Next, which chronicles in greater depth her experiences with the criminal justice system and the media, as well as other first-hand accounts from survivors and advocates throughout history. You can also find her on Instagram at Amy B. Chesler. That's Amy B. C-H-E-S-L-E-R. And on her website, which includes links to all her work, at amybchesler.com. From Wondery, you're listening to This Is Actually Happening. If you love what we do, please rate and review the show. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or on the Wondery app to listen ad-free and get access to the entire back catalog. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. By supporting them, you help us bring you our show for free. I'm your host, Whit Misseldine. 
Today's episode was co-produced by me, Andrew Waits, and Aviva Lipkowitz, with special thanks to the This Is Actually Happening team, including Ellen Westberg. The intro music features the song Illibi by Tipper. You can join the community on the This Is Actually Happening discussion group on Facebook, or follow us on Instagram at Actually Happening. On the show's website, thisisactuallyhappening.com, you can find out more about the podcast, contact us with any questions, submit your own story, or visit the store, where you can find This Is Actually Happening designs on stickers, t-shirts, wall art, hoodies, and more. That's thisisactuallyhappening.com. And finally, if you'd like to become an ongoing supporter of what we do, go to patreon.com slash happening. Even 2 to $5 a month goes a long way to support our vision. Thank you for listening. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to This Is Actually Happening ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. The number one selling product of its kind with over 20 years of research and innovation. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headache, eyebrow and eyelid drooping, and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com.